So I need control. Fick, do I need to? Aha, uh -huh. cool. And there we go. Can you see that? All right, thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. It would help if we communicated with each other better before we started. I've just jumped off another call onto this, so apologies for that. Um, so again, yes, welcome. So as you know, we're still getting to grips a little bit with our go-to webinar software. I know Sue's been doing a great job of talking you through some of the features on there. Um, as I've just mentioned, uh, as we did last time we got together, we're going to use the poll functionality to ask you some key questions during the session this morning. Um, so get ready for those. Um, so this morning, we're just going to cover um, the agenda that is up here. We'll hear from various board members with some updates. Um, we will, I'll talk through some of the guidance updates that we have. Uh, Jason and Ed will talk through some of the newborn hearing screening. Um, we've got some updates from the CSO office. Sue's going to do a session for us on communication strategies and some of the uh, dialogue that's going on at the moment around the clear face masks. And then as Sue's already mentioned very kindly, Deborah Rose is going to share with us and is joined by one of her colleagues um, to share their experiences of delivering some remote services and getting restarted again. Uh, and as Sue said, we will try and pick up questions as we go, but we'll have a little bit of time at the end um, to pick up anything that we have missed. So if we can just go to the next slide, can I do it or can you look right? Okay. Um, so just to bring um, to your attention that um, obviously on the new website, as Sue's mentioned, we've got the events section. So if you keep checking there, because we publish very regularly all different events that are coming up, not only our events, but other people's events as well. And of course, there is quite a lot of webinar action going on at the moment. So do make sure that you're checking on our website to see all the various events that are coming up. But two of our own events that we uh, will be supporting. One, there is another remote working webinar on Friday of this week. Um, so you can click onto there and that has more of a focus for paediatrics this week. Um, and then we also have one of our regional groups, the Thames Valley, um, hosting their first online webinar at the end of the month. So again, please do look at the content of there. And I guess because it is a webinar, it doesn't need to stay necessarily just regionalised. Anyone would be welcome to join that who is a member of BAA. Thank you. Um, you've heard some news about the conference. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now, who's just going to tell you where we're up to and what our thinking is about that and explore the next steps. Thanks, Claire. OK, everyone. So, yes, the rumours are true, as you would have seen. BAA 2020 is no more. However, if you've read our website, we have got some further plans. The reasons why we've cancelled um, is well, there's a couple really. The European Hearing Instrument Manufacturers Association announced that none of the companies that fall under that are able to go to any exhibitions during 2020. This includes our platinum sponsors. Um, so obviously it makes financially the conference a little bit tricky, but we also felt that we could carry on without that. But the pressure it would put on some of our other exhibitors who have also had quite a difficult year um, probably wasn't fair. And then thinking about it, we didn't think that we'd get the delegates, to be honest, because by that point, hopefully, we will have restarted. A lot of people will be having the pressures of seeing clinic and whether we'd be allowed out for any study leave in any big numbers was a bit dubious. Um, so we thought safest all round was to cancel it. So we have shifted our dates to Manchester 2021, which was already planned, but also now Manchester 2022. So whilst we're not having our in-person conference, we also decided that we wouldn't do an e-conference because I'm not sure about you, but I don't think anyone really wants to sit in front of a computer listening to a day's worth of webinars after it feels we've done that quite a lot during the downtime. Um, so we thought we'd offer something slightly different. So the conference team are getting together next week to plan a timetable of how we're going to release some content and what that will look like. So we're going to be running some webinars from some of the speakers that we'd already invited. 
some Q&A sessions. Um, we're hoping to do some digital posters, so there will be a call out for abstract for those. And then inviting some of those authors in for a, a live webinar Q&A session for those kind of subjects. And we're likely to change the subjects that we ask for abstracts um, a little to encompass what everybody's doing now, really, so we can share some of the different ways of working. We're going to move our AGM online. We might have to call it something different to make sure we get enough people turning up to that to make it core it. But we're also going to run our annual awards as well. Because um, we think people have done different things this year that definitely need recognition. So stand by for um, the call for nominations for that. That will come out in the normal way on the website. Um, and then part of conference that people enjoy is the social aspect and the networking and meeting up with colleagues that you sometimes only ever see at conference. So we're going to be thinking about how we do that, early stage discussions of whether we have a Gareth Smith House of Games that everyone can join in with, he doesn't know yet. Um, so we generally are just having a bit of a think about things. So there's not going to be an e-conference, the content will be spread out um, over the months to make sure that you can dip in and out of it. What we do want to know is what time of day would be best for that. So your first poll of the morning is to just let us know. What do you think suits main people, most people? So get your fingers, fastest fingers first. And then let us know so we can start planning. If you want to click any time and that means a mixture, I'll interpret the any time loosely. You do interpret any time as anything you want, don't you? Pretty much. <laughs> Trying very hard not to do the countdown clock music whilst this whilst we're waiting. Would that count as singing? Yeah. No. We were not allowed to sing. People log off when we sing. How are we doing for answers? Only 66% of you voted, come on. No, oh, I think we're getting... Can't vote on the poll, is it working? Can I select from the polls? Can't select from the polls. Should just be able to click on the screen on the slide that's showing. If you can't select, please can you type it in the question box? There's quite a few people that are not able to vote. Remind me how. Um, if you can't select, then please um, just. Was there something about needing to make sure you're on full screen? Yeah, we're nearly there. We're at about 75%. Yeah. And those that aren't are popping it in the question box for us as well. So we'll be able to pick those up. OK, I think we can stop it there. Thank you very much. So mainly, most people are quite keen for the morning. I'm surprised. But that's great and really useful to help with our planning for next week. So thank you very much for that. So I've not had a look at the questions, see if there was anything about conference. Otherwise, that's my bit done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. That's great. Um, so if we just move on now, Lizanne just wanted to share an update with us on the RCCP um, renewal process. Got Lizanne in the house? Yep. Back to the slide. I'm here. Um, let's go back to the slides. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's just a quick reminder. Um, the RCCP renewal, um, well, it happened over the month of May, and it's just to ask people on the call, whether you're a head of service or just someone in the department, to see if you have completed the renewal form. Um, your fee may have been 
taken off by direct debit, but you need to log in to go and click on the um, renewal form to check and see that your information is still correct. Um, so if people could just ask their staff members or colleagues to just go and check that. The, um, the PSA, the Professional Standards Authority, require that anyone who's not signed that form to be removed from an active register. So please go and check that. And that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Lizanne. So we'll move on now to uh, just have a quick uh, dive into the guidance document. Um, this is available for you in the handout section as well. Um, so all of the bodies collaborated again to look at the guidance that was available in May and just to really pick up anything that was relevant to update into the June edition. So there isn't a huge amount of change for those of you who have looked at it. Of course, what is included within there is just an update on the COVID symptoms to make sure that that covers the anosia, so the taste and uh, smell, if there's any change in that or loss of that. Um, so that's part of the required COVID triage screening. Um, and then there is the inclusion of the dry perforation, um, which came from the ENT UK and VSO guidance in terms of microsuction being an assumed safe procedure if it was a dry perforation. We have had some uh, questions come in from the guidance and I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of those questions um, in a moment. Um, but also I just wanted to draw your attention in the guidance to, um, can I have the next slide? I don't seem to be able to progress them, thank you. Um, so uh, just to the inclusion of the vestibular um, section here in the appendices in Appendix 7, which is talking specifically about some of the vestibular um, procedures that you do and the required infection control and PPE for those procedures. So there is a new section in the guidance on that. And thanks a lot to BSA uh, Special Interest Group for supporting us with that section. Um, so then really just in terms of covering off some of the questions that are starting to come out, um, and forgive me, Anne-Marie, if I say your surname wrong, uh, Bois Rivo Mitchell um, uh, sent us in a couple of questions which are in the blue dialogue boxes here. Um, but we have had similar questions coming from other people as well. Um, so one of the things really is that clearly the guidance does talk to us about um, it's OK to do micro suction uh, on ears without a perforation or, as we've just said, on a dry perforation. Um, but because we don't yet understand um, whether there is a significant viral load that puts people at risk for an open middle ear cavity um, or large central wet perforations, um, that uh, the microsuction wouldn't be recommended. But the question is whether you could still proceed to do uh, audiometry, tympanometry, impressions, etc., cetera, uh, hearing aid fittings on somebody who has got um, a, an open middle ear cavity. So we have gone back to ENT UK with that very specific question. I haven't ha yet had a response, so we will share that. So this is more opinion on what we have read and interpreted. Um, and we have used references really, Health Protection Scotland have published a very useful document that really defines the aerosol generating procedures and what puts us at risk. And notably, uh, the definition here that's up on your screen is talking about air moving across the, uh, moving across the surface of a wet wetness uh, mass. So if you're doing pure tone audiometry or TIMPs, et cetera, then it's not like microsuction where we need to be cautious because we're not, we're not moving air across there. So from our perspective, if you are wearing full PPE um, and knowing that the procedures that you are doing here are not AGP procedures, and you've done um, your COVID screening as well, um, that um, we think it would be safe for you to proceed with those. But as I say, this is more opinion than fact at the moment, and we'll wait to see what other advice we get. Um, and it would be interesting really just to get comments from anybody else on that. Um, the other area that is cropping up, of course, is about the use of air conditionings. And again, we believe that we're waiting for government to publish some advice on that. Um, we've started to dig around a little bit more. Um, 
I've been on a, a dental webinar uh, where air conditioning came up again there. Um, we're trying to find different sources to help us. Um, the Federation of European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Associations have published some, some information. And so what I think is really consistent on everything that we have read is that this is not so much about the procedures that you're doing and whether you're exposed to an AGP, but just the general breathing out and so forth and airborne droplets um, that might be around you in your environment. But it is recommended that air conditioning units are not used if they are set on a recirculation um, mode. Um, and that if it's possible, if your air conditioning unit has access to external air source, that it is switched into fresh air mode or not used at all um, and obviously now where you're in large buildings and the aircon units are all linked together then that wouldn't just apply to your localized one maybe in your booth or in your specific consulting room but would be about the central system so it would then be important to link in with your maintenance teams to understand whether the central aircon systems have been switched to fresh and they're or connected to your local one that they're safe to use. Um, there are some references up here that go into more specific sort of building and air con regulation guidance. Um, if Public Health England do publish anything, of course, we'll be the first to share that with you. Um, again, I think it comes down to local teams and local infection prevention and what your health and safety teams are saying to you on a local basis um, but definitely the trend is fresh air so where you have access to windows that's preferable um, and obviously to have your aircon units not on recirculation this seems to be the very important point to mention um, either switched off or set onto fresh um, the other thing really just about room cleanliness um, and we know that this is a difficult one for audiology suites because of the fabric that is used for sound attenuation, be that carpets or walls and so on. Again, it really comes down to talking to your local teams about what advice they can give you for cleaning of rooms. Um, and we would welcome again any department sharing any regimes or protocols that have been established so that we can share those with others. Um, we know that certain departments um, may use cleaning sprays, antiviral sprays on fabrics um, or hoovering and so forth. Some have been asked to cover um, walls with plastic, but we're not sure from a sound attenuation point of view that that's really a good idea for audiology booths in particular. Um, to replace fabric chairs with hard plastic chairs where possible, of course. Um, there has been mention, this came up on the dental webinar actually, and I've read it somewhere else, about um, the use of UV light is a, a potential um, aid to killing any viral um, in the air, um, and also hydrogen peroxide sprays, but I have no more information about it than just to tell you that came up on the dental webinar. Um, but UV light, if there's a UV lamp in the room, that may be thought to help with cleaning of the air. Um, other than that, in our guidance, um, we reference you to the care home um, links into there and how they're being instructed to keep their rooms uh, clean. Um, so that's all for me and hope that that helps. Again, really from a guidance point of view, um, we don't see much changing now until uh, and we and we obviously want to ask all of you today about how you're progressing with your reopening and your plans and so on. Um, so what will you need the guidance to do differently for you? Um, and so until we sort of have that sort of feedback and any change in government, we don't see that there'll be a need to update this. We'll clearly revisit it towards the end of the month. But we just need to understand really what people need to see in the guidance and what help that they would want to support their services from that. So thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any questions at the moment. Or um, we can there's a, a really good comment, actually. Um, so I, I presume this has come from Adrian, actually, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. It says, regarding our work environment and COVID-19, just had a comment in from my senior estates colleague. I can advise you that there is a national specialist group set up with the primary focus on reviewing ventilation system considerations across all four nations. It is from Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Across all four nations regarding the emerging data about the virus. The latest advice we have received from Health Facilities Scotland as of 2nd of June.
June has reported that while the study on th of this emerging data remains ongoing, it is recommending that existing ventilation systems are not modified to cater for COVID-19. We can only follow the guidance as it stands at present. Um, so thanks for that, Adrian. It's quite clear then that we shouldn't consider this to be an audiology only problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's 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 across everything, isn't it? Shopping centres, all sorts of things. It's got implications. So um, yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, somebody was asking about infection control. If they're using extraction fans for buffing machines, um, and is there a risk? We would just say that we they do need to be chlorine cleaned prior to adjustment. So um, you most chlorine tablets are 10 minutes in there to be cleaned so it is going to be a slower process certainly um, for that kind of extraction you will need that dust extraction um, it's a different sort of extraction isn't it um, specific guidance for PPE when conducting autoscopy impressions for young children who may not be compliant no um, so there was some guidance in ENT UK from the specific paediatric otolaryngologists that were talking about the use of PPE when we have small children is really important for staff to use PPE well because children are non-compliant in some cases. Um, saliva in itself shouldn't be more of an issue than any other body fluid so with young children if you can wear gloves when you're doing those procedures if they are kicking off then you will be fine the fluid resistant surgical mask is all that's been recommended across ENT otolaryngology and audiology remember a lot of our guidance was checked against the otolaryngology one so it's not just us um, we do have a poll about reopening so can we run that now, Victoria? Um, the idea of this one is just to give us an idea of where people already are um, and and kind of where how quickly people are planning to move um, and if people don't have a plan already in place. So that should just be running on your screens at the minute. Um, I've been collecting um, information from booth manufacturers around carpets and walls, um, which I'm nearly ready to share. There's a couple that haven't been in touch. Generally, um, there isn't any more evidence than we've had. Um, so the best I can give you is vacuuming a couple of times a day. Um, infection prevention on Hessian walls if we've got no aircon in place hasn't come up with anybody else I haven't seen it they're recommending hoovering um, more than once a day so at least every session um, for in general when we've collated them all and as I say I'm still waiting for IAC and Quiet Star when we've collected them all we will post them on the BAA website for people to access but if you are struggling to get answers from your um, from your booth manufacturer, the maintenance team for your air conditioning might be the other place to head to for some of those answers as well. Um, we've got an answer from Adrian about Buffy machines. Um, he's going to try the dental lab to see what they're doing. Um, So let me read this to you. I'm about to visit Maxvax Dental Lab to see what they use as they have single use mops and polishing, whereas I suspect most audiology departments use large mops and stones which are not changed each time a new mould is modified. That needs to stop immediately. Um, for interest, Max Factory's polishing kit to polish the likes of eyes, so they are cleaned pre-polishing, but mainly because they are likely to be slightly dirty. Oh, thanks for that, Adrian. <laughs> You've put me off second breakfast now and everybody knows during lockdown that that's important. Um, OK, so we've got responses there um, which we can share. There we go. So you should be able to see the poll 
results there. Um, again, we've, we'll collect the ones that are in Q&A as well, um, but you can see that there's a good chunk of people waiting for trust sign off. There's still about a third that haven't got a plan in place, so any help we can give you, any contacts we might be able to find you that for some of your specific questions, please just email us offline. You can go via Victoria or BAA admin and we'll um, we'll try and catch up with those. Um, if we can help, we will. As I say, in terms of booths, they're not giving us great advice, um, but we will release what they've given us so far. Okay. Okay, thank you. So yeah, just looking at those numbers, it's interesting. If we think plan in place, waiting for trust sign off means also perhaps imminently within the next one to three weeks, then I guess we're near half of people waiting to go, I suppose. Um, somebody's just asking about providing mass to patients. So their, their trust is saying that they shouldn't be providing mass to patients as there's no evidence that it helps. They're not ready to see patients without both parties wearing a mask. Any advice? Um, generally, just the, the guidance and wave the guidance at them. We have looked at this and we do mm. believe that because there is the potential in things like impression taking and a very small potential with um, with a toscopy well yeah wax removal definitely but with a toscopy there's a very small percentage that will cough um then the advice is is definitely masks both ways because of course your mask only protects the patient from you really not you from them so um yeah we would say that the evidence is there for both ways because of the cough and the potential for cough, although it's not a GP, it is obviously going to cause us some issues. Um, Jason, before you start, there was a question for you, so don't let me forget that it's here. Okay. Can you hear me all right? We can. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, so had a meeting with PHE on the second, so a couple of points to come out of it. The first point and probably the most important point for audiology services is if you are currently on S for H, ringing patients up or ringing parents up, putting them down on S for H appointments as attended just to meet your waiting time targets, please do not do this. It is standing out like an absolute sore thumb in the national data set. And if it continues, services will be contacted by by PHE to say, please do not do this. The only way it should be attended is if the person, if the baby physically attends the appointment. So the baby physically comes to the clinic. Okay. So that's the first point that they wanted to raise with me. The second issue is around second wave. So PHE are already looking at what happens if there's a second wave. Um, so if there is a second wave of COVID, the idea is that the first document, the first guidance document around you can stop your services if you wish to, will again come into play. So the idea is basically we will revert back to that document and then once the wave begins to suppress again, then it will go back into the, um, the restart document that's been recently come out. So then the next thing we've had is we've had discussions around the restart document. Now, none of the audiology points are changing, but they've asked for some clarity around, or some services have asked for some clarity around the screening documents. And that's more where the catch up clinics have started. So this is where services have started to catch up their newborn screens. And mums are then saying to them, actually, I don't want to come in. I don't think it's safe yet. I don't want to bring my baby in. And at the moment, the PHE advice is continue to offer them an appointment to 12 weeks. So you should, if mum says that, you should say to them, well, they need to be seen by 12 weeks. They need to have a screen by 12 weeks. Our service has been deemed safe by the trust and by the local area. If you don't want to come in by the time your baby's 12 weeks, we will take that as a decline and 
we will set them on the system as decline and they will receive no further audiology follow-up. So that is what they're currently wanting to change that to. That does not change though for audiology. So what they've decided is if a baby has failed the screen and you want to bring them in for a diagnostic, but mum says, no, I don't want to come out for a diagnostic, we cannot set it as a decline. We should continue seeing them until the point where we, un, un, until the point where they come in. So they must continue to be offered appointments by audiology, but screening wise, they should only be offered an appointment up to 12 weeks. Now, we have a few issues with this that we're working through on the wording that's going to go into the document and I was hoping to share with you some of the wording today but unfortunately it's having to go to the highest levels of PHE to get signed off so hopefully it might be some point next week because my biggest concern with this is it's parents these parents are not saying no I don't want to engage with the hearing screening process they've just deemed that it's not safe for the time being and it feels a bit un fair to turn around to them and say well actually it's 12 weeks or you're not getting anything um, you've got to you've got to come in by then else you're not getting anything we do have to draw the line in the sand somewhere um, but I just have some concerns about how it's been worded and we're working through that so I think the key point is um, we'll get some more guidance around that um, and there will be a new version of that document hopefully next week or the week after um, and we're still working through it at the moment and in the meantime please don't try to um, fiddle the figures with your KPI too. Uh, we've got what's that? Assigning a parent to decline consent due to risk issues becomes fairly harsh. Uh, uh, these are all points that I have raised and these are all points that I feel strongly about as well. So for example, one of the points that, I, I will say freely, one of the points that I raised was the NHSP document clearly says that babies can be seen up, screened up to six months in exceptional circumstances. Why can we not go to six months for this group? And the reply that I had back was, these are not exceptional circumstances when we when we looked when we meant exceptional circumstances what we meant was babies that have been unwell to which i said well you're going to have to then stand up and defend that these are not exceptional circumstances a global pandemic doesn't fit and was told by the team from phg they're quite happy to do that um so we are up against it um so what, what if patients accept an appointment for diagnostic audiology and then DNA? Um, same as always, so they should be offered a further appointment in audiology, um, should be contacted to find out why they've DNA'd, and then if they continue the DNA, they should be set for an eight month behavioral follow-up, so they should still be offered eight months behavior. I think there's another question further off, I'll just keep going. Yeah, there David, was one question about, sorry, COVID positive mums. Yeah. Uh, where are we there? I'm uh, it's I'm Roberta sorry. Campbell. What approach are services taking with newborn screening of infants of confirmed COVID-19 mothers? Are these infants being screened in maternity units? And what IPC precautions are being applied? Yes, so the, the, the COVID, COVID positive mothers, the feeling from PHE is they should be screened as normal by, by the screening team, provided they're wearing appropriate PPE. So the babies of COVID positive mothers should be screened. Um, and then once the baby is clear, because I asked about I asked about if mum, so if mum turns around and says, actually I've got symptoms, at what point should that baby then come in? And was told it's fine to bring them in two weeks after. So to bring them in two weeks after the mum's uh, finished. So two weeks after mum's having symptoms. So the standard two week time. Um, there was a question about can people make local arrangements to see the babies behaviourally if they've declined the screen? Presumably that's still acceptable. That will be... I don't know is the honest truth. I will have a word with PAT about that. They are very, very keen that these babies do not remain around in the system is the issue. Um, 
we're not overly happy. I would say the people that are on the call are not overly happy with their explanation around things. So we are trying to get some more, more clarity. What I would say is if the strong feeling from people on these groups is that it's not good, then um, we could take that, I could feed that back more to PHE and say, look, I've had this call and the, the strong feeling is that people don't like this idea that if they don't come, they've gone from the system. Because I, I agree with it. Um, screen's not critical. Uh, sorry. Screen's not critical. I'd argue the authorities got this badly wrong if mum's positive. Um, they, the thing is that whilst we agree screening's not critical, what's the what's the alternative the alternative would be i suppose to wait two weeks and then screen them after that or do that so we could we could look at that i will mention that again um so far please same plus rest of the organization was there another question sue that you said about no that was when karen picked up okay um so yeah we are I would say I would say it's a constructive dialogue with PHE, but what I would also say is the process along the whole pathway has brought some severe questions into account for the I think what's become apparent is nobody in PHE that now oversees the screen is an audiology clinician. Um let's let's say that. Um or assess it. So, but uh, we are not screening COVID positive mums. While our service is time limited, yes, but so few are now confirmed on admission. There's no need to offer screening on an inpatient basis. And um, I think the key key to that inpatient question is it depends what your service currently looks like. So, a lot of services for newborn screening have restarted in the community as well. But some services, like ours, for example we haven't actually restarted our newborn hearing screening community clinic so we're only screening babies on maternity at the moment so in that case you would have to screen on maternity or they're going down as missed um yeah i'm happy to sh i'm happy to share my email so that's it's jason.smalley s-m-a-l-l-e-y at nhs.net is easy um Surely if parents want to wait screen long due to COVID anxiety, they will get a GP referral for the behavioural anyway, so why not telephone follow-up? My issue with that is we didn't want to throw behavioural audiology under the bus, if that makes sense. So um, the, the, there are likely to be a large number of these. I, I think there'll be quite a large number of pet babies that turn around and say, we don't want to be screened yet. To put them up to eight months, to put them all to eight months, would imply that they've all got to be seen at that time, and then um, we could have a few issues with capacity at eight months. My my also thought is that um, where are those babies better off? They're probably still better off remaining in the screening program. Um, screeners can screen up to six months. It would be an OE only in most in most cases. Why not leave them in the screening program? But we are we are fighting a um, a uphill battle. Okay. 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 Just, can we, Jason? Can we round back on a few of the more general questions? Yeah. Um, so somebody was asking about um, face masks and they're just saying don't give them to patients because that's in line. Adam um, has also got that advice and it's across his whole trust that um, patients aren't wearing face masks, just the, um, the staff team. Um, they're all being screened, all being really well screened. Um, they're having temperature taken and everything else on the way in. Just a quick word on temperature taking. If somebody's got a BTE hearing instrument, they need to take it out before they arrive so their temperature doesn't isn't too high if they're using an ear thermometer. Um, but they are um, essentially PPE for the staff and not for the um, patients. Adam's department have started routine, um, very low footfall and social distancing uh, appointments again as well. And the staff team are happy with their PPE. 
Um, it's there's another question about criteria to see ENT patients for a hearing test. ENT um, otolaryngology released guidance, and that guidance says that all testing should be, uh, all audiology testing should be back online, but that it has to be ordered by a senior clinician um, rather than just a routine set of screening tests that they might do from a standard ENT clinic. Um, so it is. It is in that otolaryngology guidance rather than in the audiology guidance. Um, as far as audiology is concerned, there isn't anything that's a priority. You should just be getting to the point where your trust are agreeing that it's time for your place to restart and that you have a plan in place. Um, in terms of what ENT are ordering, um, in terms of what ENT are ordering, they're ordering tests. Um, but they should be following the otolaryngology guidance. So if you look up the referenced otolaryngology guidance from ours, it definitely talks about how they should behaving, be behaving towards audiology. Okay. Can um, I just, go on. Can I just back on one point? Um, some people are saying that their service has got very few um, mums deferring screening. Um, that, that's great. I think that that's a really good point to make that um, mums should be being encouraged to come in, especially where it, it's safe and talk through the talk through the precaution that you've got, etc. Do do talk it up. Um, my concern is with the ones that still still decline. What what we do with those? And I was going to say something else. I think the other issue is that 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 idea that mums not many are deferring screening isn't actually coming out in the national figures so it's still looking like a, there's a large there's a, the, the coverage is very low at the moment for nhsp okay and then i've got a question about air calorics um so air calorics on intact tympanic membranes are fine um, with appropriate PPE, which is just the surgical mask, uh, fluid resistant surgical mask, um, and it's in the guidance. Um, air chlorics on perforated and particularly wet perforations are definitely not advised um, because of that potential for middle ear mucosa to be disturbed, which may cause an AGP. So you'll find that in the joint guidance that was released um, on Monday, which is a download in the handout section of this webinar. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Lots of really rich uh, sharing of experience, which is brilliant and questions. If we can move on now to Kath, who's going to share with us some of the uh, outputs from the CSO office from a recent webinar. Thanks, Kath. Over to you. Okay, we can't hear Kath. Let's see where she is. I don't know that she's actually on at the moment. She she did message to say she's got connection and she was back on. So um, somebody's looking for advice on headphone covers for hearing assessments, and I know that um, Claire's looked at that a little bit. Cass says unmute her. Let's see if we can yeah. find her. She must be in she there must be go. in 10 oh, yes. days. There, there she go, is. <laughs> Good morning. Morning, Cass. Okay. okay. So um so both Michelle Foster and I um jumped on this webinar last week. Uh, I've made some notes and I've put them in these uh, discrete headings because they, they talked around these in di in different parts. Um, so the, this was presented by Professor Sue Hill and uh, Angela Douglas. So they talked first about diagnostic recovery in the NHS. And, and remember, they're not just talking about audiology. This is general healthcare science. Um, so the main points were to, um, to make sure that um, health and well-being is maintained and supported, and that's for all healthcare staff. They also said that the COVID-19 pandemic has provided an opportunity for science being at the centre stage in various areas. 
and uh, we'll, we'll drive a new way where science is the centre of the workforce and not just NHS science workforce. So they're talking about cooperation with other scientists and that's been essential, so private labs as well. So uh, thinking long term more broadly about the scientific community in general. Um, Sue Hill said it's clear that we've come off the main peak now but we'll need to see what happens when restrictions are relaxed and they also need to think about what happens when the seasonal flu starts to impact in winter. Um, they did say about um, needing more people going forward especially if we reach a peak in winter months but not what we were going to do about that. They thanked everybody who'd been involved in working in whatever areas outside their own uh, areas and it's been recognised by government. So looking at testing, and this is testing, this is obviously not audiology testing, but testing uh, the antibody testing. So they talked about the test track and certification approach, and this is making sure that labs who are doing these testing are certified and accredited. Um, it's going to be carried out by other providers, including the NHS. And I know now the serological testing is happening. It's happening in my trust too. We can now have the antibody test as from this next week. Um, and they said that it's going to be on NHS staff first, so it's open to all NHS staff. You don't have to have had any symptoms. Then it's going to be on patients and then social care workers and their um, uh, people in care homes. So the aim is to ensure labs outside the NHS meet the standard and can be accredited. Um, going to the healthcare science workforce, so now in the future, and because a lot of us have been involved in different areas as well, uh, and taking on additional skills and having stepped up in different ways, they, they felt this needs to perhaps happen more going forward, long term, and thinking about different ways of working generally, not just in our own disciplines, but having some multidisciplinary um, networks probably, and uh, especially in community, and how they can go forward with that. So that's being looked at. Um, they were saying that respiratory physiologists have been involved in ventilation both in hospital and community and they will continue to be needed in community settings so i think that there's a push to to move things more into community there they did say a shout out to all the audiologists and others involved in swabbing uh, pathology and biomedical sciences involved in testing and the clinical engineers involved in equipment procurement testing of it and making sure it meets specification then tracking it and sending it out to where it's needed and apparently some healthcare scientists have been working in the cabinet office. Now going to PPE and hearing loss, and I know this is quite a, a big topic and there's some more coming on this. So the point was raised about staff and patients with hearing loss and the difficulty of communication when wearing masks. So they're going to push to procure masks with clear panels for healthcare and also for use in schools where children have hearing impairment. So I, th I know there's something coming up about that, so I won't go into that anymore, unless Michelle's there and she wants to talk about that. Um, they talk I about go on, I wasn't going to talk about um, PPE, in, I wasn't going to talk about clear masks in terms of PPE. So okay. if you do have that little bit, that would be good. I think Michelle, didn't Michelle send something about around, um, uh, they've been testing so it's um it's paul white at adam brooks he's the regional lead engineer he was looking to develop a mask um but they've been they've been actually testing some of them um yeah. because at the moment the ones that are available are not ce marked are they no so um, there isn't a ce marked um no. clear face mask available in the uk at the minute um so they are trying to develop one that will meet all standards so that work is under where i guess is where we're at and we um we will keep an eye on that and make sure paul keeps us in the loop on that one for you okay sorry i thought you had more i'll go no 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 i haven't <laughs> just no that, that's that's fine um that's that's all they talked about a, a mass then the next thing was about regional healthcare science networks. Now, they, these work well in some areas, but in, in others, they, they haven't been probably as effective. But now there's a push for regional healthcare science leads and the healthcare science leads in trust to work together to ensure that healthcare scientists are in, in the places that they need to be and actually to maintain the networks going forward. And there's a need to put these in quickly. Uh, Ruth Thompson was mentioned as the regional healthcare science lead for the South East and all the good work she's done during this time. Uh, there was questions asked around 
how we continue to maintain what healthcare science has been doing, and that is to work with Health Education England to ensure adequate training. So they, didn't, they only mentioned Health Education England. Um, and then restarting services. So I know that's, that's the thing that we're all talking about at the moment. So the, there's a need to start urgent and then routine outpatient and surgery, especially cancer, cardiovascular and stroke services and how these can be started safely. I think that's the one thing that for all of us, it's how we do this safely, isn't it? Um, and then, then again, making sure that health and wellbeing of staff, um, there is a document um, deploying the healthcare science workforce and there's links in there for health and wellbeing support, including apps and taking care of ourselves. There's also been a risk assessment published for the healthcare science workforce by NHS England, and that's on the Department of Health website. There's also a piece of work in progress on how the NHS workforce will be different in the future. So again, this is, I think, because we've been working successfully in different areas and, um, you know, you know how, how do we look in the future? Then they talked about UCAS. UCAS will be starting their assessments from September uh, as they've been stood down for the six months. Actually, I'm having a virtual assessment next week. So they're, they're still doing them, but they're doing them virtually. And then the last thing uh, they talked about was the uh, scientist training program. So at the moment, um, they're looking to provide a lot more teaching virtually and online. And uh, HBIs are looking into this at this present time. So I'm sure that uh, Lizanne and Tim can say a little bit more about that perhaps later on. But that, that was it. So that, that was essentially the, the key points that I pulled out. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's go to the next slide. Do you want do you want okay. to just mention about this, Kath, as well? Um, yes, so this is this is a request, isn't it, from Sue? Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, yeah, this is what she said. So they want to they want to look at, at clinical and so what we've been doing that's that might be innovative and that we've had to change within our specialities. Um, so they they would they would like it's, it is an online um, thing. There's a form you can fill in online. So. There are, they want to ask a lot of questions actually, you know, um, looking at what changes we've made, uh, how we measure the benefits, what patient outcomes are. I think this is probably going to be ongoing as we start services again. And, and especially about yeah, needing to sustain the change. So how can we carry on doing what we're doing if it's working well? Okay. So yeah, if you if you uh, there's a, a link there, so if you can go on to that, that would be good to share some of what's the innovative work that's been happening. Thanks, Kath. Yeah. Um, Michelle Foster is on, Vic. I don't know if we can unmute her if she's got anything that she'd like to add from the CSO perspective. Hello. Um, no, around the CSO thing, the around the clear mask um, discussion, we can put on the website a link to the testing that Paul has done around the mask because um, he's tested them to the ISO standard. Um, I've tried escalating it within my own trust right up, but unfortunately, because um, it doesn't meet the CE mark and it doesn't adhere to the EN standards, then um, it can't be counted in the NHS setting. So that's where I'm at at the moment with my trust and we're looking at other alternatives. Now we will, as um, it's been previously said, keep in touch with Paul at Cambridge because he is looking at developing a clear face mask that does meet the CE markings for the UK. And I guess as soon as that's gone through, we can let everyone know. It is a massive problem though. And we've had a lot of complaints from the deaf community who've been hospitalized and things. So not just within our department um, through the COVID period. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. That's great. So we'll try and keep close to that and, and keep you posted. So I'm going to hand um, back over to Sue now, who's just going to share some more insights really on communication strategies at this difficult time. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to the article that gives us the most information about what the problem is with face masks. Um, and we can see that um, the FFP3, which is the equivalent of the N95, is up to 12 dB in those high frequencies. 
Um, so 12 dB of reduction in the high frequencies from 2K to 7K is what we're seeing there. But even a very simple cloth face mask is three to four decibels. So there is an article around that. Of course, the other thing we're finding is lost aids, particularly in terms of open fitting. If people are wearing masks um, in more social situations and also some comfort with RICs, there's an awful lot of information from user groups about um, wearing little bands with buttons on um, rather than putting them around your ears. And it's the sort of information that it's really nice to put onto your um, patient information parts of the website um, and certainly something that you can pull together really quickly and really easily. We've talked a lot about the problem and we're not talking massively about some solutions while we wait for a, a properly um, a properly certified mask for, um, for use in medical environments. So we I think we really do need to start talking about things, other things people can do. And those of you that are on Facebook and Twitter will have seen me post this um, because I thought it was just a really simple piece of information we could all choose to get out around our trust. Um, to give them some ideas on what they can do. I thought some of the interesting things were those mini whiteboards, but I also thought about the um, video chat. So I thought that was quite quite good where people can move out of the room um, with the patient and use a video system, a FaceTime system or any of the attend anywhere type apps um, so that they can give the information in a safe space without the mask and people can see their faces for lip reading. Um, normal gestures, all the things we would talk about with a patient when we're talking about their um, benefits in terms of communication strategies are really useful to pass on. There's been a lot of talk on social media about the different apps um, and the live transcribe and the Google Translate and the transcribe on, on the iOS systems as well. Of course, we've all got free access at the moment to BSL interpreters for patients to use. Again, bringing them in via video call, um, so much easier. I'm gonna, give you a kind of feeling that it's okay to talk about the problem and it's okay to try and work behind the scenes to get a solution. But in the meantime, we should be talking to people about the very simple things that they can do um, in order to help with communication. Um, I'm sure some of you picked this up and some of you, you didn't, but these are digital flashcards from Card, Card Medic. Um, don't go on on a wobble day is all I can say to you. And I'm pretty sure you all know what a wobble day is at the moment. Uh, they are really there for medics working in quite critical care parts of the organisations that we're in. So they are very much about the conversations that they want to have with people about next of kin, about um, what happens if you need resuscitation. But they are very... Um, very simple to use. The idea is that they're brought up on a, a tablet for the patient to see as well as to hear the questions. Um, so it is a nice flashcard. It's been developed by a couple of trusts working together um, and it is useful to point your staff to. Um, and finally, a bit more of the the sort of audiology suggestions from me really. The first one would be to set a COVID programme. Um, so if you are seeing somebody, you might want, and they are talking about struggling now, people are wearing masks. You might want to increase just the soft sounds above 2K. If you leave the MPO where it is, it will help because of the noisy situations they're getting in. But a very simple programme they can use if they have more than one programme on the hearing aid and they're able to access it to overcome those frequencies that are missing. A good communications handout. Um, so something that you can put on your website, something that people can download. There are lots of them out there. Action on hearing loss, NDCS, all of those have good communications advice. But something that you can give to people, to families and to medics if they ask. 
do not forget that patients might have remote microphone technology themselves. They may have gone out and bought the mini mics and, and the various devices. Those are great for times of social distancing, aren't they? Because you can hand it over to the person you want to hear. They can clip it on and you will remove that social distance. They're really easy to clean because essentially they don't have very many crevices and corners. So it would just be a wipe or a spray on a cloth that would clean that after use and would potentially give your patient quite a lot of information that they're not getting because they're either distant or somebody's talking through a mask um, and as I say the tips leaflet which includes live transcribes for your online information packs as well so really simple stuff and then I'm going to make a plea I've been in audiology 30 years this year and I'm really worried that there's a lot of us that are going to wear masks in public we're going to wear them for social situations as we know that it's going to be the polite thing to do um, and there's a lot of evidence that simple cloth masks in enclosed spaces will reduce transmission if everyone wears them the basic tips are that they're more than one layer of cloth and that you wash your hands when donning and doffing them I'm using the word donning and doffing just because it winds Claire up now because she can't stand the word so it's amusing to me but I would say to you that I can't fathom the idea of being out in public where I know people randomly might have a hearing loss that I'm speaking to and them not being able to at least get some visual cues from me so there are lots of tips on the cloth face masks um, for oh, I don't want to call it social use but public use um, around clear panel cloth face masks and the NDCS brought two or three of those links together in the blog the other week but you can google it and find lots of information so I guess it's just me saying as audiologists maybe outside of our departments we should also be leading the way in shops and in in sort of general public places wearing the clear panel face masks and again loads of tips on how you um, stop those misting up and becoming useless apparently bar soap if you can get bar soap is really good to rub on to keep them from misting up so it was just really me pleading to you to not just think about the fact we don't have any CE marked ones, but to put that other information out there for people. Great, thanks very much, Sue. Um, there were a few comments just coming up in the chat box about cleaning of hearing aids um, and a little bit more on some mask design. So I'm sure um, anybody um, that has any ideas on the mask designs that Paul White will be uh, happy to receive those. And we'll make sure that we share all of the different links for any of the references that we've used during these presentations for you. But just in the spirit of time, I'm going to welcome Debbie now, um, because Debbie has got some really great information to share with you all. So I'd really like you to be able to hear uh, Debbie before we finish this morning. So Debbie, over to you. Thank you. OK, can you all hear me OK? We can. We can. Thank you. Um, how am I going to move the slides? On. That's me, just say. Just say, right, okay. Now, unfortunately, um, my slides are um, pretty boring because I've just pulled them together very quickly. So um, I've still kept the information on them just in case anybody wants to go back to them at, at a later date. Um, so just an overview. Um, I'm from the NCA, which is Northern Care Alliance, and um, we're the northeast sector of um, Greater Manchester, so that's Bury, Rochdale, and Oldham. We're community services with supporting to ENT, um, and we have a hub in each borough, but we've also got outreach community clinics, and we're an all-age service that also um, hosts the newborn hearing screening programme. Uh, can we move on? Okay, um, I was asked initially to talk about um, what we're doing around paediatrics and tinnitus and the vestibular um, appointments that we're seeing. But um, what I then did is I just extended a little bit just in case it was useful to sort of talk about our whole um, COVID process. Um, so when we got the immediate um, call that we needed to lock down, we felt it was really important, um, first of all, to ensure that all our staff were um, 
fully up to date with what was happening in the service, especially since we have 54 members of staff across three different boroughs. So we put into place um, twice daily to start with um, staff conference calls um, through Power, which is an expensive service. Um, but I think staff found it extremely valuable to know exactly what was going on and to feel really up to date with how we're moving within the department. Since the immediate lockdown, we're um, still having one daily call and staff still feel that it's invaluable. Um, so we closed all our hearing aid drop-in sites um, to start with like a lot of people did, but we continue to give telephone advice. Um, we've had a click and post service up and running for a long time where patients can actually just go on the internet and um, request batteries and tubing and domes, which we just send through to them. So we're quite fortunate that um, that was up and running before um, COVID came along. Um, and we also set up a drop off repair service that I know people have been speaking about where patients have rung up, we've, agreed, we've arranged for them to drop them off, we've then repaired them and then we've actually gone out and posted them back through the patient's doors because what we were finding was that the postal service was extremely slow um, over those first few weeks. And we continued all our follow up appointments by telephone, so the face to face ones um that we had booked in we we didn't cancel them entirely we actually just made them as a telephone call uh, we stopped all face-to-face -face appointments apart from diagnostic abr following newborn hearing screening as a trust um, we were still able to do that whereas i'm aware that a lot of trusts actually stopped all outpatient appointments we continued to issue hearing aids to babies from the NHSP um, that had a moderate or worse center of neural hearing loss. And um, our tinnitus and vestibular appointments, rather than just being purely canceled um, by the administration staff, they were canceled by clinicians so that they enabled a little bit of advice um, around the condition and also some signposting. But the NHSP service was maintained. Okay, could move on. Um, just an update on how the NHSP service has been working. I mean, our, our NHSP lead, Catherine McGee, has been keeping abreast of all the technical guidance um, and has really sort of pr pretty much followed it fully um, because we've been able to, because the hospital has enabled us to um, continue to see the patients. Um, so we put in a 7 to 7 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily screening um, that was increased according to guidance um, but we also continued um, some of our outreach clinics um, because again we were unable to do that. The, this enabled less babies to be referred for diagnostic screening um, as any parents that maybe weren't screened on the ward we saw actually in the um, community and we continued to keep getting in touch with patients who didn't want to be screened to offer them screening you know for, for a number of weeks afterwards and by being able to do that um, we've now only actually got four outstanding babies to test who have chosen not to be screened so i think that although in sort of the early days um there were a lot of parents that maybe didn't want to come in we're now finding actually that after a few weeks, they've sort of said, yes, I'm quite happy to come in and they have been tested. Um, and because we're pretty much back to near normal as far as the, um, the NHSP service is considered, um, we're looking at um, coming into a recovery phase and um, going back to our 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. days. I think that the problem with that will be um, around social distancing because now we're back to compressed hours um, we've got to work out ways in which staff can obviously distance to do the screen. We could move on. So stage one recovery, um, what we did in our services quite early on is we, um, we were asked to put a recovery um, plan together and we fit it into four stages really. Um, just sort of how we could sort of progress through time. Sorry about that, I've got my alarm on. Um, so stage one recovery is that we 
really, really went out and highlighted our click and post service to the point that we were getting 708 patients going on the internet and getting all the consumables via that service. That's not all the consumable service because we still had the telephones where people were ringing up and would still send things out via the telephone as well. Um, we introduced Accurix video consultation that I know has been spoken about on a number of um, other webinars um, for simple repairs and we also introduced them quite quickly for um, tinnitus consultations. We offered and implemented Accurix hearing aid fittings for new patients. Um, initially these were the patients that we'd maybe done a DRC on them and done a hearing test so we actually had their um, hearing test results so we could fit them online and, and that went really really well. Um, for those that consented to using the different technology. And we also did Accurix consultations on the hearing aid children um, to offer support and reprioritise waiting lists ready for the second stage. Um, and for ear moulds for the children, what we did is because we used um, an ear mould company that we'd asked them to take a digital mould, um, that we were asking them to then process them then for a slightly larger fit. So we could move on. We moved into stage two recovery probably um, about three weeks ago, um, where we started to um, do to talk about face-to-face -face issues on less vulnerable patients who could not access video fitting. We didn't actually do any at that point. It's probably only in the last couple of weeks that we've started actually putting that into place. Um, we changed our protocol for issuing babies, referred from NHSP, um, so that any baby that we actually um, diagnosed with a, with a hearing loss, we're now fitting hearing aids on face to face. Um, although one was done due, um, via Accurix because mum was hearing impaired and was, was very knowledgeable about hearing aids anyway, and that worked very well. Um, we started doing some face to face assessments. Um, on children that are under the age of four years old because obviously some of those um, patients we might not have had full um, audiometric information for the hearing aids and things particularly could have changed on that age group. We did first, we've started doing face-to-face -face assessments on priority patients that were not in the vulnerable category so adults that were um, under 70 and children um, that didn't have any other medical conditions that might have made them vulnerable. And we started to implement Acurix um, for dizzy patients and for patients with auditory rehab. Um, so if we could move on, I'll just go into a little bit of detail as to how we moved on with them. So the under fours, the first thing that we actually did um, was that we reviewed the total waiting list to determine which patients um, were classed as priority and determined which ones of them would actually need to come in for um, an audiometric assessment. So the way that we actually then moved on is that the clerical team rang the patients and offered them a choice of um, a video or telephone assessment and um, we booked an appointment. At the Accurix appointment and the video consultation or the telephone font consultation, the patients were asked if there were any problems, um, they were re-advised of the click and post service because a lot, although we had mentioned it, weren't particularly using it. Um, if the video was in place for an Accurix consultation, then we were checking the aid and the mould fitting um, and we were sending for moulds if there were any whistling. If it was suitable, we also took a full history and um, undertook the peach. If the patient then was deemed urgent um, or it was a necessity to bring them into clinic, we have now started bringing them into clinic. We've been advising them of um, social distancing, one parent only, uh, not to arrive early. And PPE, we were advising them beforehand that PPE would be, work, would be worn by staff. Um, when they attended the appointment so that if they would if they had a child that was of an age that would understand they could have that conversation with the child so, so that they won't weren't worried um, if they weren't able to attend then the decline and they declined the appointment um, then what we did is we wrote a letter to the GP about 
any current concerns and the teachers of the deaf and we re put them back on the waiting list. Um, next slide, please. So the clinic appointments, obviously we, um, what we tried to do is to minimise the appointment time. We'd already taken the history, so we just asked if there were any particular changes. Um, the PPE were, as has been advised by the BAA, so we were wearing apron, gloves, masks, um, and our organisation has said that we have to use visors as well. Um, we were using telephone interpreters as required, um, but what we did is we only actually did tests that we felt were absolutely necessary. So if we had a child that we knew previously, you know, it had been confirmed to have a sensory neural hearing loss, and there was no conductive element, and PTA was still showing that on the day. Um, we didn't go ahead and do any tympanometry or otoscopy. We just did what we felt was really deemed necessary um, for that appointment. If the digital if the digital mould wasn't suitable, then that would be a time when we'd retake impressions um, manually. We gave out management plans to the parents and um, we contacted the GP and the teachers of the hearing impaired um, as well with a letter to let um, after the appointment. Since then, though, we have actually had some information from our trust saying that from Friday, they do want patients to be wearing some form of face covering. Now, for that appointment, we were, um, or the points we've been doing, we've only really been asking the parents to put face coverings on all the children if we were taking impressions or doing otoscopy. But moving forward from Friday, all staff have been told if they're in any corridors, then they've got to wear face coverings um, and any patients entering the building without a face covering, um, the organisation will be giving them. Obviously, that will be challenging with the children, but it's just something that's coming into force us from next week. We can move on. So the outcomes, um, up to date, we've done 34 accurate consultations on preschool children. Um, 12 of them have accepted a face-to-face -face appointment, um, but seven refused due to COVID and worries over PPE. 15 were added back to the waiting list because after the Accurix appointment, it wasn't deemed necessary to bring them in urgently. Um, what we have found with the Accurix appointments is that even though we've sort of spoken to the parents um, and they've agreed to them, we are still finding that just like normal clinical appointments, we are getting some DNA. Um, we've also done 32 Accurix consultations on older um, complex hearing aided children. So these would be the children that um, we would still have in the younger children's clinics because they've probably got um, something like learned disabilities or they may have a syndrome. So they're, they're slightly more difficult to test. Um, of those Accurix calls, um, we, had, we did 30 that required a support call only and um, needed to be added back to the waiting list and we brought in two for face-to-face -face appointments. The Accurix appointments have been going really, really well. Um, the patients have been really happy with them. Um, and even the patients that didn't want to have a face-to-face -face appointment felt that there was a lot of um, value in the consultations and it gave them an opportunity to learn a little bit more about how the repair service worked at the present time and how to order extra supplies. Um, the children so far, I think there, was, there were concerns that the children would be really upset about seeing staff wearing PPE. However, we've not particularly found that at present. The, the children responded really, really well to the staff wearing the PPE um, and the staff felt comfortable seeing the patients. However, what they have reported is that it's really quite hot and stuffy wearing the PPE. Um, and obviously with the lots of cleaning and having to think about what they've touched, how they're going to do different processes, they've found it quite stressful as well um, and clumsy. So I think that all these sorts of things um, will improve with time, but it, but I think it's quite challenging and staff do need breaks in between seeing some of these face-to-face -face patients. So next slide. Helen, is it possibly worth you talking through these slides because you've been seeing these patients? Yeah, can you hear me? Is, yep. Hello. Yep, you can hear me. Okay, yeah. Yes, thanks, Helen. Um, 
Okay, so we initially started to uh, telephone the patients um, to see if they'd be happy with uh, a video consultation. If they weren't, then we, we offered it as telephone. Um, interpreters were available for both our uh, both video and telephone appointments. Um, the appointments were booked, and obviously we went through all the um, usual uh, question checks when we when we're booking the appointments and letters, leaflets, questionnaires were all sent out. Um, the just video appointment undertaken, yeah, so we have patients that were discharged following video appointments, patients placed for further review. Um, if audio available, patient offered hearing aids via the video fitting. Noise generators have been supplied as um, and fitted via video fittings following the tinnitus appointments. Um, and we've been signposting to BTA or the charities um, uh, applications and environmental aids. We have been making referral to mental health service and scans, although we are aware that, that although scans are still being um, appointments offered, it, it is a little bit slower at the moment and, and there may be a delay there. I just want to move on to the next slide. So some uh, outcomes here now for tinnitus. We've we had 49 patients on our new waiting list, and out of those, uh, we saw 24 video appointments and 16 telephone appointments. Um, three awaiting response and five declined teleaudiology uh, tele and one DNA. Interpreters has been really uh, good. It was a bit scary at first, um, but the very, very simple to use with Acurex, very easy. Uh, patient extremely happy having that, that interpreter there and that chance to, to use um, the interpreter and, and carry on with their, their um, care um, and management. We have fit eight hearing aids and eight noise generators, uh, all issued remotely from those new pathways. Um, Again, like Debbie explained earlier, we, we posted those out um, prior to a fitting video appointment and went through everything that we would do as we would face to face. In addition to those 14 new pathways uh, mentioned, we've had 26 tinnitus review appointments consisting of 20 video and six telephone. Staff feel that they are getting all the information that they would do uh, in a normal face-to-face -face appointment. Um, the fact that we can see the patient, the counselling aspects of the appointments working really, really well. And the patients are really, really happy. Um, I'll just talk, look at those patient comments in a minute. But if we look at the outcomes up to now, we've had uh, seven patients discharged following that initial appointment. 60% of the patients actually want their review by uh, video, which we, we felt was really positive. And the, we've got 22.5% uh, that have no preference, whether it's a, a video review or face-to-face. -face. And the, the, the feedback is, I'm sure those that are already using it will be able to um, reflect this, but they, they feel so much more relaxed. Um, one that I really liked was that it saved money and reduced pollution on the roads, which was better for the environment, fitted better with work, thought was really good. Um, people that are very anxious, you know, they've got patients that have got a lot of stress, anxiety, we're seeing that you know that they're more relaxed and able to maybe take on board more what we're discussing with them basically because they're at home and they don't have to do that, that journey into clinic. So overall, uh, really, really positive using Acurex for our, our tinnitus patients. And moving forward, I think it's something that we will be taking uh, into account. Okay. Okay, um, on to the dizzy clinics. Um, this is something that we've really only just started over the last week. Um, that we started setting up probably two weeks ago. So um, basically we've been using the same procedure about contacting the patients um, and offering them a video appointment via the secretarial staff. And um, we are looking at, and those video appointments 
I've also been given some extra information when we've sent out the letters um, regarding some of the information around exercises and we've been sending out the questionnaires with the letters. We've also devised a leaflet um, that sort of sent that she's covering some of the logistics um, and some of the preparation for the appointment, um, which includes the needs for a chair, a pillow and a flat surface. Um, all the Dizzy Clinics at the present time um, are being completed using Accurix, but moving forward into stage three, we will be doing some face-to-face -face appointments as well. Um, so the BPPV appointments, um, we've been taking full medical history um, and all the pat on patients, and um, Wendy's been performing the Dix Halpike test and the Eplum remover. Um, with instructions to the patients, so showing the patient first what she wants them to do, um, and then she's been watching them whilst whilst they do it um, in the home environment. So from a say, I think one of the main concern was around safety. Oops, sorry, could we just go back? Um, but what's actually happening is the patients performing um, the actual manoeuvres um, on a floor or a bed. Um, which they felt quite comfortable with, um, with use some pillow support under the shoulders if necessary. Um, and we've put a link on the um, on the slide if anybody wants to sort of look at some of the exercise programs that we've also directed them to. And we've then made some follow-up appointments and signposted to the Brandt Daroff exercises if required. So far, we've seen six new patients. Um, we've only had feedback because we've only just reviewed two of them to date. Um, one patient, the disease, the disease symptoms had gone completely and one patient required a repeat EPLA. Um, we've not included the BPP figures for reviews um, as they're normally overtake, undertaken over the telephone generally anyway. However, what we've said is if the, there are some reviews that can't, that the patients are still having symptoms, then we will do an Accurix video call to move them forward. So next slide. Um, and for the vestibular rehabilitation, again, um, we did the full histories before we saw the patient. Um, we sent out a VRBQ questionnaire when we sent out the appointment letter. Um, but Wendy has been able to do via um, Accurix the guest stabilization test, um, Romberg's ensuring sort of the safe places, etc., um, and possible tandem Romberg for younger and more able patients. She's put exercise plans into place and again um, signposted them to the video that we have on our website. Um, we also have something called um, Flow Technology in, in our organisation, which is um, a text service where basically if a, if a patient agrees, what we do is we um, send them a series of text messages um, which is just encouraging them to continue with their exercises, um, giving them some extra information as they as they go along, um, and that's been working really well. Helen, do you want to mention anything about that floor just whilst you're on? Yeah, yeah, uh, we set up floor now probably about three three years ago, three to four years ago. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. We devised. Um, six weeks worth of text messages um, initially those text messages were twice uh, twice a day uh, for the first week or so and they're giving out lots of information not not just a reminder to do the exercise but really positive um, bits of information including things about motivation, um, as well and the benefits of doing the exercises um, so they, they go down to maybe about two to three uh, texts um, a week at, at the end. But yeah, patients seem to be finding them really useful as well. And certainly at, at this moment in time. OK, thank you. And the um, as you can see below, we've seen nine patients so far. Um, two discharged at the first appointment as the symptoms had already resolved and seven have completed the VRBQ questionnaire. Um, and we'll follow them up to see how things are going in a few weeks. Next slide. So what are our next steps? Well, we're, we're really moving into stage three now because what we've said is that um, as 
as sort of things have relaxed and more people can come out um, and we're being advised to see some more face-to-face -face patients this is on non-symptomatic sort of non-symptomatic patients obviously um to move towards stage three so our stage three plan really which we've, we've started to move into now that we're sort of exhausting a little bit of um, what we can do online is to see um all non-vulnerable patients um from a face-to-face -face point of view and when we say non-vulnerable we mean sort of predominantly more the under 70s or those with um out any health issues um we're still looking towards some same day assess and fit of hearing aids however we're sort of teetering on whether actually to do the assessment and program the hearing aids and then fit wherever possible via Accurix so that we've got less face-to-face -face interaction. Um, we're going to be testing all non-vulnerable children. Um, vestibular clinics are going to be put in place. We're going to be seeing all our um, non-vulnerable children, not just the under fours. And we're going to be doing domiciliary visits on, again, the non-vulnerable patients to start with as we move into stage four. And I think that a lot of this moving between the stages will depend upon the priority of the patient um, and also how much capacity we've got in the service. Because although we want to move forward to seeing more and more face-to-face -face patients logistically because of social distancing and the numbers of patients that we can have in the waiting room then that's you know that's not going to be an easy process um, and there's going to be a lot of work around that how to, we can strategically bring people in and out um, and then stage four would be to be going back to seeing all patients um, undertaking suction clearance although I think now with the latest evidence a lot of that we could potentially move into stage three. Um, there's the drop-in repair session, which we had prior to COVID-19. I'm not sure that that will actually happen. I think we might end up doing that differently. Um, and the final thing that will come back on board is school screening. Um, I think that the main things that what we're sort of always keeping in mind is though, that it's remote working wherever possible and moving ahead until we get any different guidance. I think that's the way we're going to remain. Some because of obviously the social distancing and the risks, some because, well, actually some of the remote working works better um, and patients are finding it's a better pathway from them. We are being asked um, how long it's gonna take before full recovery. Um, ooh, I don't know what the answer to that is, how long is a piece of string? Um, we've got huge waiting lists now. I don't know um, about other services. Our DMO ones have gone through the roof and um, we're breaching now some RTTs as well. Um, so I think we've got a huge challenge and I'm basically saying to my senior managers, well, I don't see a full recovery and a full um, increase or reduction, should I say, of the waiting lists for, for several months, if not 12 months, um, just to the reduced capacity because of the social distancing and the number of patients that are um, on the waiting list now already from the 12, 13 weeks of lockdown. And that's it. Um, sorry, we've, we've gone through that really quick, um, but I don't know if there are any particular questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, um, Debbie and Helen. It's been a really useful, very nicely structured review of your whole journey from the start of lockdown to where you are now. So I hope that other people have found it really helpful. I appreciate there's still quite a lot of people actually that have stayed with us online, although we have gone over time. Um, just in terms of questions, um, Leslie is just asking whether the tinnitus patients had already had a hearing test, your new tinnitus patients, before you saw them. Yeah, they, they, the ones we've seen up to now, they, they have had uh, he, uh, audiograms available. I don't think that would stop us from um, maybe give, providing advice, um, but then putting the right measures in place to make sure we obtain audiogram uh, as and when we can. But up to now, we have had access to, to some, some audiometry, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that's all specifically for you too. Although, as I say, I think it was really, really useful oversight and hopefully will help others with their sort of planning. 
Um, there are a couple of other newer questions that have come in more around some of the stuff that you just alluded to really, um, Debbie, in terms of waiting management and so on and meeting targets and things. I know we heard last week about some of the target and um, uh, payments arrangements changing. So I don't know if anybody wants to pick up and comment on Rena and Julie's um, comments around waiting the six to eight week window for children's fittings and then the um, RTT being abolished or changed. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to make any comments on those. I mean, the RTT, we, we got something out straight away um, saying that we shouldn't be stopping the clock times, but I would presume that the government will be aware that some of these things won't be met. I think the yeah. difficulty as well is around the six week diagnostic target, which is the one which we're obviously grossly um, now breaching. Yeah, and I, th I think that there is some acceptance of, of the fact that it's unrealistic to expect those targets to be met. And, uh, and we heard that certain trusts had already moved across to some block payment type schemes. Um, I'm appreciative of the time now and that we've kept people. Um, if there is anybody that would like to ask anything or uh, get any follow ups, you can pop that into the questions uh, box. What we will do is because there's been a lot of dialogue today, which is great. Um, we'll go through all of this and theme it and, and come back out to you with a with a document, a bit of a kind of a QA and a uh, response and just a capture of some of the things that have been discussed today and the relevant links. Um, uh, I think Vic has already put all of the links there in the chat box for you, but we will recirculate all of those again. Um, okay, I guess we'll bring it to a close then. Thank you all very much for sharing and all of your attention today. Um, and we will continue with these sessions um, every other week um, for as long as you wish them to be. And if there are any subjects or themes that you would like us to highlight, then please do let us know. And we're very happy to try and respond to that for you. Um, and again, as well, just regard in any kind of um, switching back on plans, plans for recovery, if anybody would like to share that or ask for any assistance, as Sue said earlier, um, we're really happy to try and, and support that where we can. So thank you all very much and we'll close the meeting there. Thank you. Thank you.